Hi, welcome to my channel Cardiology and Beyond. I am Dr. Sonali, an interventional cardiologist from India. Today's video is going to be on the mechanisms of the first heart sound, S1. On mind mapping today's video, we are talking about a topic under clinical examination, auscultation and heart sounds, of which S1 has these host of six questions. So try to answer them first and then go through the video. Let's begin with some physics. What is the basic understanding behind the production of heart sounds? To understand heart sounds, let's first understand the plumbing system which is present in our homes. Now some plumbing systems cause banging sounds which are heard especially at night when everything else is quiet and this is known as water hammering effect. So what happens in this is that the moving column of water comes to a sudden stop, that is there is a marked deceleration and as a result the energy of this column dissipates and that leads to the vibration of pipes as well as that of the column of water and that produces these sounds. Now in order to decrease these sounds, in the olden plumbing systems there used to be introduction of an air. And this air chamber within this plumbing system would get compressed and it would absorb the shock and hence the sound would decrease or disappear. In modern plumbing systems, there are something known as water hammer arresters, which are small devices which are connected to the pipes and they contain a spring loaded shock absorber. Now when it comes to heart sounds, moving column of blood comes to a sudden stop or decelerates significantly which leads to dissipation of energy and that causes vibration of blood and surrounding structures. Of course, we require these heart sounds to occur, we want them so that we can differentiate a normal from an abnormal heart sound and hence there is no need of a shock absorber in the heart. So what events produce the first heart sound? Now, S1 signals the onset of ventricular contraction. However, before the phase of ejection, wherein blood moves from LV to aorta, there is a phase called as isovolumic LV contraction, in which the aortic valve has still not opened, but the pressure within the ventricle has just started rising. So, as this pressure rises, it imparts energy to the mass of blood within the cavity. Now, the pressure in the ventricle initially exceeds that of the atrium. When that happens, the column of blood is set in motion and the blood rushes towards the atrium. At this point, the aortic valve is still closed because the left ventricular pressure has not exceeded the pressure in the aorta. So as the blood is now rushing towards the atrium, the leaflets of this atrioventricular valve are lifted into the closed position and the papillary muscles contract and pull on the cordy to prevent the eversion of leaflet inside the atrium. So the entire valve and the subvalvular apparatus is in play to keep the leaflet closed but not everted inside the atrium. So now these closed leaflets stop this moving column of blood and that leads to sudden deceleration and as we've already learned when there's sudden deceleration it sets the surrounding cardiac structures and blood in vibration and that leads to the production of M1 on the left side of the heart and T1 because of closure of the tricuspid valve on the right side of the heart both of which contribute to the first heart sound. So what are the characteristics of a normal first heart sound? Now, as we already know, it is made up of two components, that is M1 and T1. T1 is soft, it occurs at low pressures and it is delayed than M1 and normally it is not heard. Overall, S1 is loudest at the apex and the left sternal border in the fourth intercostal space. S1 has a lower pitch and a longer duration and that produces the sound of lub. This is in contrast to the second heart sound which is sharper, shorter, has a higher frequency or a higher pitch and it leads to the formation of the sound dub. 
Now S1 is often timed with the onset of the carotid pulse or the apical impulse because as we know it signals the onset of systole. And this is a very important piece of information to differentiate S1 from any other sounds. So if the sound is occurring with the carotid pulse or the apical impulse, that means that sound is in phase with these events. So it is most likely to be S1. Any other sound, for example, S2 will occur out of phase with these two events. So it is less likely to be S1. Can M1, T1 split be heard? It can only when the separation between these two events is more than 20 milliseconds. It is sometimes seen in children. How does the left ventricular contractility affect the intensity of the first heart sound? Now remember the intensity of the first heart sound will depend on the energy which has been imparted to the column of blood by the contracting ventricle. That means if the left ventricular contraction is vigorous, that means there will be a greater energy which is given to the rushing column of blood that is going towards the closing mitral valve. So when such a high energy column of blood hits against the closing mitral valve, it will produce a high intensity of the first heart sound or a loud S1. So when you have a vigorous contraction, more myofibrils are recruited and there's a faster rate of rise of pressure in the ventricle. So rate of rise is determined by dp upon dt, that is change in pressure upon change in time. So when a very high pressure is set up in a very shorter time, then it leads to more vigorous contraction and that contributes to a loud first heart sound. So this dp by dt is measured at the time of mitral valve closure because remember in order for systolic ejection of the ventricle to occur, we require the mitral valve to be closed. So this time of mitral valve closure is known as pressure crossover point which is here. Pressure crossover point means that the left ventricular pressure has now suddenly risen. So when you look at the slope of dp by dt, that is the one which de determines how loud or how soft the first heart sound will be. Now dp by dt depends number one on the left ventricular contractility. Obviously if it's more contractile, more vigorous in its contraction, then a very high pressure will be mounted within the ventricle. And second, it also depends on the left atrial pressure, which means that if the baseline left atrial pressure is very high, for example, if a patient has mitral stenosis and over time the left atrial pressure has been rising then the left ventricle has to contract even more and has to get a very higher pressure to overcome the LA pressure because the mitral valve will close only when the left ventricular pressure is overcoming the left atrial pressure. So if the left atrial pressure is high then the LV pressure should be higher in order to close the mitral valve. So when you have left ventricular dysfunction, then the contractility of the left ventricle is depressed. So the rate of rise of the pressure within the left ventricle will be less. So you have a decreased rate of dp by dt and because it is low, you get a decreased intensity of S1. So this is dp by dt. Here it is, if it is flat, that means the intensity of S1 will be less. If it is more steep like this in this direction, then the intensity of S1 will be more and you will get a louder first heart sound. How does the PR interval affect the intensity of the first heart sound? Now first remember that short PR leads to a loud first heart sound and a long PR leads to a softer first heart sound. This is the first heart sound and this is the second heart sound. Okay, so the first heart sound is prominent when you have a short PR. So what happens when you have a short PR interval? The left ventricle begins to contract before the left atrium has had a chance to fully relax. Because of this short PR, the relaxation of LA is not complete. As a result, the LA pressure is still on the higher side. 
So it remains high at the time of pressure crossover that is the mitral valve closure point or the pressure crossover point wherein this LA pressure has not completely normal has not completely normalized. As a result the pressure crossover point here you can see is quite high. So you get a higher dp by dt and hence you get a loud S1. Another reason for a loud S1 with short PR is because the, the relaxation of LA is not complete, the mitral valve leaflets are wide open. And because they are in a state of being very wide away from each other, they close with a bang and they lead to a louder first heart sound. Now this is in contrast to what happens with a long PR interval. When you have a long PR interval, the left atrium has a lot of time. So there's complete relaxation of the LA before left ventricular contraction sets in. So the left atrial pressure has now completely fallen to normal pressures. As a result, there is a lower pressure crossover point, which is here, as opposed to here when you have a short PR interval. So you have a low dp by dt which is a flatter curve if you look at this this slope is steeper and this is more flatter so you have a flatter curve of a flatter slope rather of dp by dt and that contributes to a soft s1 also another reason is because the left atrium has had time to relax completely the mitral valves also start floating up towards the annulus they do not completely close but they start floating up towards the mitral annulus in anticipation of the upcoming systole. So when finally the QRS complex is inscribed and when the LV starts getting its pressure risen in anticipation of systole, the mitral valve excursion is not that much because it has already floated up close to the annulus and hence it closes not with a bang but it closes quite softly. How does the intensity of the first heart sound vary in complete heart block? Now in complete heart block there is complete AV dissociation that is atrioventricular dissociation and the P waves are non-conducted. Even though there is no relationship between the P waves which are seen on ECG and the QRS complexes, still the intensity of the first heart sound is related to the supposed PR interval which we see on the ECG paper and it follows the same rules. That is, the S1 is louder with shorter intervals and it is softer with longer intervals. So, in this example, this particular beat, this one and the last one, show a short PR interval. Even though this P does not give rise to this QRS, still the interval or the association between them is of a short PR interval and that contributes, these two beats have contributed to a loud S1 as you can see here. This black is the loud S1 which is thicker and bigger and the blue inscription is the S2. And in places where the association between P and QRS complexes is that of a long PR interval or a wide PR interval that has given rise to a softer S1. This is soft S1 and this is the S2 which is not affected. What is the intensity of the first heart sound in mitral stenosis? It is usually loud when the leaflets are pliable, but it becomes soft when the leaflets become calcific. So watch the upcoming video of the first heart sound in various pathologies. As always, like, share, subscribe, comment and press the bell icon and I'll see you next time with another video.